Winnipeg specifically, exclusion exists uh, because our systems create exclusion. Economic restructuring has been going on for at least 500 years, if not longer than that. We need to build an economy that generates uh, a society that's for people, <laughs> uh, an economy that serves people. Can we create good inclusive jobs at the same time as we tackle waste in our communities or poverty and in food security? The way we define community economic development in many definitions, but the way we look at it is the community mobilizing to change its economic base and to provide well-being for as many members of the community as possible. When we think of CED in Manitoba and some of the really great things that are happening right now. As a student of CED, I see the origins in a lot of that in what was called the Great Northern Plan. Even though the Northern Plan didn't come to fruition in an all-encompassing way, the way that we would have liked to seen it happen, I'm convinced that we see vestiges of, of the Great Northern Plan. And we have certain strategies in Manitoba which most organizations follow. Uh, the main one is based on the Nietzsche principles. Many of them were based actually on an approach to economic development which was um, an international approach called the Convergence Strategy, which was developed by someone I worked with in Tanzania, actually, but who was originally from Guyana, uh, C.Y. Thomas. John talked about a Convergence Strategy, which means that you produce what you, you consume and you consume what you produce, and getting away from the idea of just um, either exporting what you're producing or importing what you're consuming. Um, converge those things so that you, are, you become more self-sufficient and it's also very much based on thinking about what the needs are in a community. You'll find a convergence strategy built into the Nietzsche principles, where community organizations are designed to maximize local employment, keep the surplus within the community, train people, treat people respectfully. Our CED principles incorporate that, the economic linkages and the ownership and control issues. And then, and then the other piece of those principles was about human dignity. You know, we need to build an economy that generates uh, a society that's for people, <laughs> uh, an economy that serves people. my entire life. So all my family, all down the street, so it's very nice to walk down the street, say hi to be able to say hi to everybody and know them. I love the I love my neighborhood and I don't think I'll ever leave it. I'll never leave Point Douglas, I think. I love it here.
We're in the Social Enterprise Building here just off of Main Street in North Point Douglas and it's an old warehouse that has been converted uh, into office space and we have everything from social enterprises such as Aki Energy and Build and MGR, the organization that I work for which is the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives which does research, uh, the uh, Canadian CED network. It's a combination of organizations that have at their core the belief in uh, community economic development, social enterprise, uh, communities self-directing themselves, working for themselves um, for the social and economic good. Aki Energy is basically what we do, our mandate is to provide an employment opportunities within First Nation communities and also, also to uh, uh, keep the economies going within the communities. Any First Nation, Garden Hill, and all the communities we work with, we want to be able to put the communities and build capacity. Uh, when I was chief, I don't mind saying this at all, uh, those numbers are outdated. Our, our total budget for one year for everything was about $17 million. And, uh, and whatever went in, I would say 85% uh, of that almost left the community almost right away. The social enterprise model is very indigenous in terms of where everybody benefits. So Mother Earth Recycling is an aboriginally owned and operated social enterprise. In Winnipeg alone, it's estimated that there could be anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 mattresses that go into the landfill every year. So mattresses and box springs come into the facility and we break them down, tear them apart, and we separate the fabric, the foam, the metal, and the wood, and that gets 100% recycled. We offer e-waste recycling services, so that's through e-waste that comes in that can no longer be used or is damaged or broken, and it gets sent out for recycling, so it gets broken down into its parts and recycled properly that way. We also run a refurbishment store, so electronics that come in that still have a second life to them, we fix them up and we sell them in our storefront. We also do repairs. So our social enterprise side of our business means that we provide jobs and training opportunities uh, for us because we are an Aboriginal business. Our focus is Aboriginal youth in the community that have multiple barriers to employment. So we take youth from the community who maybe don't have their grade 12 education, don't have job experience, sometimes people who have passed uh, incarceration, gang affiliations, addiction problems, things like that, and primarily employ them through the mattress recycling program. And we give them some basic job skills and then also help them with resume building, applying for jobs, using our network, things like that to get them employment. We're located in a perfect situation here in Winnipeg. We're right beside the Social Enterprise Centre. So we get to work directly with places like Sednet and Social Enterprise Manitoba and all the other social enterprises that have the experience that we don't and we can learn from them. And then hopefully one day we can help other social enterprises grow by being located right here. To me, the social enterprise side is just common sense that you do these good things because they're the right thing to do. Um, not knowing that this was actually a movement, this was an organization that you can get involved in and there's other social enterprises. It's hopeful that there's more people out there that recognize that this is something that needs to be done and the more people that are out there talking about it means more people will hear, more people will listen, more organizations will get involved and hopefully one day it won't be unique, it won't be different, it'll just be commonplace that everyone does this because it's the right thing to do. Diversity Foods is a social enterprise located at the University of Winnipeg. Our primary function is we were created to serve good, wholesome food uh, to the students of the University of Winnipeg. Everybody seems to have this belief that institutional food service has to be this ugly thing, that, um, that it has to be based on shelf-stable foods, that it has to be based on these frozen, horrible puck burgers that get flown halfway across the continent. That in order to actually be successful as an institutional food service provider, you have to use coffee that's derived by forced and child labor. And I just think that's wrong. So for the record, before starting with diversity, I had never heard of a social enterprise. I 
uh, had never worked for a cooperative. I'm, I'm from the business community, um, from the restaurant business community. This is a very new reality for me. You can change systems and you can create new, like, once you understand the systems and the systemization of the food service industry, you can modify it and twist it and, 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 and figure out where you can sort of short circuit it and still get your returns and still have a viable business and be able to affect social change. Right now we have a total of 92 staff. Uh, we are in a 24 hour production cycle because it's September. So the bakers come in at night to make sure that there's fresh baking for all of the students and faculty first thing in the morning. So all the muffins and banana breads and zucchini breads are all fresh baked. We hire people who are, who are marginalized from traditional employment. People who have cognitive or physical disabilities, people coming out of the justice system, uh, newcomers to the country. We intentionally seek out the Aboriginal community and urban city. You know, I get to work with, um, with people who really care about what they do. I get to work with some fantastic newcomers to the country. I get to work with uh, some people who really, really want to do better and really want to work hard and want to, want to be successful after they come out of the justice community. Yeah. And so because of all of that, it makes me very happy in what I do, just because I didn't get to do that in the, in the past. When I worked in the provincial government, I worked for, it was called the Community Economic Development Committee of Cabinet. And the one, one of the major files that I was responsible for was to look at what we could do in government in terms of policy around community economic development. I mean, of course, I was familiar with the CED principles, the Nietzsche principles, um, having you know been involved in, in the inner city. And so we just basically said, okay, well, that's what people are using here. And we want to encourage more of that. It comes from a solid foundation of research on what works in terms of building local economy. And so we just decided in government at that time, well, we're just going to use that as our model. And I think that was really important because, again, in the spirit of CED, we shouldn't be in government deciding what it is, right, what principles people use. These principles have been developed in the community, so let's use them. CD work branches through our organization, so different areas. Most of our work right now is focused on kind of youth employment and in terms of CD. So we run uh, two main programs. We run a first jobs for youth program. So that program, uh, we hire kids to work for us over the summer, and they either work in our community gardens or in our youth programs. And then we run a youth crew program, and that's more on the lines of a social enterprise. It's a catering service and yard care and snow removal. So we do a lot of kidding jobs. It's growing every month, <laughs> so it gets bigger. Uh, we have about 100 kids in that program, and the kids will work, you know, one job a month or maybe two or three jobs a month. Uh, but they'll just come in, you know, one night do some cooking for a job or those kind of things or baking or whatever it is. Just an opportunity for youth to get their first experience working a job, getting a little money in their pocket. Um, it works great for uh, gang prevention programming, so there's a lot of temptations from the streets for youth to get involved in crime or whatever, but if they're working a job or know they can get money by coming and working, then that's a really easy way to keep them on the, on the right path and engage positively. So give them the opportunity to work with staff and kind of learn the job, what recreation services are like, and, and then eventually get those jobs. So we try to hire as many of our youth as possible to work for us. A lot of capacity has been built in the inner city since then, so throughout the 2000s until, you know, up to this point. Um, as, as we're seeing now, a lot of it's vulnerable. People are starting to see the government sort of uh, pulling back on funding for some of that. I would argue that we shouldn't be trying to pretend that it's self -thing, these things are self-sufficient because they shouldn't have to be self-sufficient. They're doing work that nobody else is doing. They're doing work that's needed to be done because the state has failed. They're doing the th things that the private sector doesn't. You know, all the training, you know, working with the most vulnerable people. These are things that are not easy to do. And so it's gonna cost money and, they're need and th that we shouldn't be um, afraid to say that we need state support to do that. We need to keep saying no to what's wrong, I think, and we need to find ways to creatively oppose that and talk to our governments and talk to people doing what we don't agree with. But we also really need people who are dreamers and are builders and who are sort of nose to the grindstone people who will just go and make the things that we believe are better. 
they're going to fail sometimes. They're going to struggle sometimes. Uh, they're going to need support of a whole bunch of pieces around them, the financial world, the government world, uh, the, the public, the market, customers. Um, but they're really putting their hands to the problem. Like they're building new ideas from citizen grassroots action. And there was something very captivating about that for me. Because of the kind of uh, economy we had before emergent trade, you know, the communal ban societies, I think that they're, those were really um, healthy cultures in a sense that people looked after each other in a, in a way that was really excellent. And, it, and it, was, it was based on having an economy that, that caused people to, to, to need to share and care about each other. You, you know, your economy demanded it, you know, that you had, everybody was involved in production of food, clothing, and shelter. The idea of the whole community being involved in production of, of at different levels is what generated a sharing and caring culture. And so there's a big connection between economy and the society of people. You know, there was a big connection. And if we want to save our our values and we have to build commercial institutions that support that and sustain that over a long period of time. So that's that's the motivation. <laughs> it's like nobody's going to show us how to do this, you know. Nobody's going to uh, give us the power to, you know, build a healthy economy so our people can be healthy. We have to we have to do it and we have to make it up as we go along, you know. That's I think real a lot of really hard work <laughs> and that's probably why no, not too many people are doing it. <laughs> I live in Headingley and I make my product in this little building. Uh, I make wild blueberry jams 50 years ago. My dad would take us all to the bush, camp all summer. We picked blueberries from morning to evening. I left home when I was uh, older. I went into the Air Force. And then years later, I started all over again with wild blueberries and I started uh, making jams. I froze my berries, I sold the uh, berries in the wintertime frozen, and I made jams. I supplied some of the bigger stores, but not the chain stores. They can't afford to pay the price that we charge. I supplied to the market, and one of the stores that I sell to right from day one was Nietzsche Commons, or it used to be Nietzsche Foods. When I look at the blueberries, sometimes I think about when they were picked or who picked them and all the labor that went into the blueberries. It's a nice feeling to know that you provided employment, starting from the pickers to me, to Nietzsche Commons, and then back to the community because some of the same pickers will buy the jam. I, I, it's a circle almost. Commons. It's run by the people who work here who, who also own it. It's a worker cooperative and we wanted something that the Aboriginal community can be proud of and, and Winnipeg can be proud of this place. We have a produce section, a bakery. Our signature product is Bannock. We have a full range grocery store and a meat cutting operation and uh, on the second floor we have a 60 seat restaurant where we have, uh, we serve breakfast and lunch and, uh, and late afternoon uh, meals. The second floor also has Nietzsche Niche which is a, an art store and it's a beautiful place. Moccasins and other products that people are producing. There's over 200 artists and artisans that put their work on consignment in that store. And so it's really supporting a lot of that work. It's the informal economy that's going on and we've always been committed to 
supporting uh, Aboriginal producers and local producers as well uh, in, in food and in, in other products. There's no not being part of the, uh, the, the wider commercial food system, but at the same time, you know, we try to find the opportunities um, where we can support local producers as much as possible and we can support uh, production going on outside of the uh, city. I love my job. I love my co-workers, you know, and, and I think that's the most important thing in a job is, you know, waking up every morning and wanting to come. All the food is fantastic. It's homemade. All the burgers are gluten-free and made fresh in our meat department. Um, everything, all our buns, pies, is made fresh in our bakery. Well, we're, it, it's, it's a very poor neighborhood, you know what I mean? We need this here. It's cheaper here to buy you know, in bulk than it is to go to you know, a corner store and just buy day-to-day -to -day or whatever. Right? You have to sell a lot of food just to make a little bit of money. <laughs> and uh, right now and for the next quite a while, most of our money is going into paying off our debt. We're carrying a really heavy debt load. We came out of the construction phase of, of our uh, project with a huge debt load. Looks like we might have to sell our land in our building um, just to get out of that debt uh, crisis. And if that's the case, then we hope to have a compatible landlord who will support our business. It, it, Nietzsche's not closing. Nietzsche as a business is not closing. We're just probably, maybe, uh, probably losing control of our land and building and we will be tenants. I think you just have to keep going and just keep moving forward and, and uh, trying to address the problems that we have here every day. And, you know, we've, we've got some huge uh, challenges being in this neighborhood, and, um, but that's the context, the social crisis that we live in, and that's what we're up against. watching people come into the network or come into this work, one of the ways we do that is we have this big conference every fall called The Gathering and it's, it's open to anybody doing community development or community economic development. They all come, it's huge, there's between five and six hundred people every year. And every year at least one person comes up to me and says, oh, A, I didn't know that I was doing this work, but I am, and B, I found my family. I think it's a crucial way of organizing and I think um, it becomes very clear that our state or our governments can either really enable that work or they can restrict it or, or not support it. I think the, the wind in the sails of that work needs to be community members coming together and calling for action and talking to each other and meeting each other and deciding what's important. Uh, and then our governments, our funders, our financial institutions, our business sector can decide to invest and enable and support uh, or not. I think as a consumer, there's lots of ways to decide to act differently. You know, choosing to spend your money with a worker co-op, that's an easy action probably. The price is probably about the same and you're supporting a democratic action in the economy. Capitalism leaves gaps, leaves holes. And so the question is, can CED either fill, either fill those holes or could you envisage a system that replaces capitalism with a community-based approach, uh, which is much more equitable and democratic. So these two schools of thought within CED and, and the very least we try to do is fill gaps. But there are, there are uh, other approaches which seem to suggest that what we should be doing is actually working towards replacing the system and using the CED experience as a way forward. When people are spending their money here, it gives people an opportunity to be in real solidarity. Um, as opposed to charity and I think that's an important opportunity to have. I just want people to recognize that uh, we're all in this together and, uh, and that we need to build a better world and a better economy that serves people and, and we're all part of that. We're all part of that. 